Tonight begins the sixth World Voices Festival, an ambitious undertaking inspired by vision and energy that has firmly won its place in the international literary world and New York life. Penn's large thanks go to Carol Llewellyn, the festival's director, and her associate, Beth Weinstein. for the care and imagination and hard work that have gone into making this festival one we feel already will be our very best. We thank, too, the festival committee for their part in giving advice and assistance. A full measure of thanks and continuing thanks go to our former president of Penn and the festival's chairman, Salman Rushdie. The festival was his idea, and our admiration and gratitude recognizes his ongoing role, his inspiration, and his counsel. When Salman began the festival after September 11th, he wanted to keep America and the world in touch through literature, through a devotion to free expression, and to do it in the name of and through an international literary fellowship. Of course, Salman knew these echoed the very founding principles of Penn when it was formed in 1921. What Salman and Penn have done in creating and sustaining the festival is to make it an embodiment of Penn's character and purpose. I welcome you here tonight and throughout the festival in the spirit of Arthur Miller, the great playwright and former Penn president who said, the most convincing example, if not proof of humanity's oneness, was the universality of the best literature. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome to the podium a very touchstone of the courageous struggle for free expression and a literary voice and imagination of rare quality and vivacity, Salman Rushdie. Hello. Thank you. Well, here we are again. Um, I'm now in the sixth year of my five-year term as chairman of this festival. <laughs> um, it reminds me of when Douglas Adams published volume four in the Hitchhiker Trilogy. <laughs> and, um, that's me. Uh, but I just wanted to say, you've had all kinds of people being thanked, and I think, you know, Caro and Beth deserve lots of thanks, and we are the people who've supported us from all the different cultural institutes to help us bring writers here, and the people who've given us money, they all deserve thanks, but actually the people that we feel most grateful to are yourselves, because it's been wonderful to see how year after year this thing keeps on building, and, and, and how loyally people come back, and how interested they are in, in this very wide range of wonderful writers who, who come to New York City. Um, so thank you, and I also would like to thank the writers for coming. It hasn't been the easiest year to get to New York um, because of that little problem in you know, Iceland's revenge. Um, uh, but on the other hand, I think it, it shows that the volcano was essentially a fan of literature um, because it relented just in time to allow almost everyone, one or two people sadly have not made it, but almost everyone has made it. Uh, having said that, and before I get off the stage to let it begin, I wanted to point out that there are, of course, writers who can't make it. And one of the things that Penn always wishes to draw attention to uh, is the plight of those of our colleagues around the world who lack the freedom to travel and the freedom to lead their lives as they would wish, um, either because their travel is restricted or because they're imprisoned or in, in various ways oppressed. And the, re the reason why 
this chair is here. This, a chair like this will be at every event um, in the Penn World Voices Festival, and it's there to remind us that there are writers who need our help and who cannot get here um, because of the plight of their circumstances. So I think we should remember and recognize the absent writer. Um, having said that, I'll get off the stage and we'll start. Thank you. Good evening. Good night. My name is uh, Daniele Mastro Giacomo. I'm an Italian journalist. And it is a pleasure to read you in Italian some few lines of my book, Days of Fear. L'aria scelta per la sosta notturna è avvolta dal deserto, ma punteggiata da campi di papavero da oppio. Ci sono altri corsi d'acqua, la vegetazione è più fitta, ci sono molte colline in pietra e sabbia. Il comandante lì non si fida delle piste, compie lunghi giri, manovre azzardate, supera alti dossi e poi ripide discesa con sbandate, inversioni e sgommate che alla fine lo fanno insabbiare per quattro volte. Abbiamo forato in due occasioni, e mentre i pick-up si affanno uscire dall'ennesima buca, un botto secco ci annuncia che anche il terzo pneumatico si è reso. Il comandante esce dall'abitacolo, si gratta la testa spostando il suo turbante nero, osserva il pneumatico senza più anima, tenta una soluzione disperata, tira fuori un piccolo compressore che si alimenta con la batteria del mezzo. Rimane lì, con i soldati già sparpagliati sulle vette delle colline circostanti, a osservare il manometro. La lancetta che indica la pressione sale lentamente in un silenzio carico di attesa e di tensione. Tutti, io compreso, concentriamo le nostre energie per uscire da questa situazione ridicola, al limite del grottesco, ma molto pericolosa. I rumori di una jeep in lontananza mette in allarme. Il soldato sulla collina più lontana lancia un fischio e poi il verso del cammello. È un convoglio militare, forse britannico, e lontano due mujahedin mi schiacciano sulla sabbia, mi indicano col dito di fare silenzio. Obbedisco con il cuore che torna a battere forte. Pochi minuti, la tensione sale alle stelle. La ruota è di nuova gonfia. Saltiamo tutti nel cassone, prendiamo la direzione opposta del convoglio, ci infiliamo in una gola chiusa da tre colline di sabbia. È calato il buio, ci fermiamo per la notte, si accendono i fuochi, si cucina la cena, solite patate con i soliti fagioli, si scalda il peggiallo. Con Ashmal e Sayed prepariamo il nostro letto, una stoia rossa e le nostre tre coperte. Sono legato mani e piedi, con il freddo della sera le catene mi gelano i polsi, le caviglie sono protette dalle calze con cui cammino da sei giorni. Cerco di dormire, calcolo quante sigarette mi sono rimaste nel pacchetto, le fumo con molta parsimonia, è già un miracolo averle in pieno deserto. Il cielo avvolto dal, dal solito mantello nero illuminato dalle solite incredibili stelle, ma sono depresso, abbattuto, mi devo abituare a una lunga e difficile prigionia. Mi attacco a tutto. Ogni novità è una sorpresa, una buona iniezione di fiducia, di speranza. Ho bisogno di un segnale, di un contatto dal mondo esterno. Devo sapere che c'è qualcuno che vuole liberarmi. Il contatto arriva mentre cerco di dormire. L'uomo del satellitare, quello che considero un ufficiale del gruppo selvaggio, si avvicina e mi chiede a Tres Ajmal. Tua moglie è incinta? Lo guardo sorpreso, non mi risulta. Ma è una domanda curiosa, suggerisco... Avremmo voluto una figlia, ma ne abbiamo già quattro, due ciascuno. Ci abbiamo rinunciato. L'ufficiale sbuffa, legge un appunto su un foglio e insiste. Come si doveva chiamare questa nuova figlia? Tremo per il freddo e l'emozione. Deglutisco, capisco il segnale, mi stanno cercando. Vogliono una conferma che il contatto sia con il gruppo giusto. Ci sono molti sciacalli in giro, soprattutto nei casi di sequestro. Mi faccio forza. Antaia, volevamo chiamarla Antaia. L'uomo del satellitare ripeto il nome, si assicura della pronuncia, si allontana, chiama qualcuno, torna verso i raggiante. Antaia ripete, good, very good. I soldati sparpagliati sulle colline di sabbia, nascosti in anfratti scavati nella terra, dietro spunzoni di roccia, distesi vicino al fuoco, ascolto in un silenzio quasi religioso. Poi esplode in un boato che rimbomba tra le pareti il nostro rifugio all'aria aperta. Antaia, 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 urlano felici, quasi fosse un compleanno. Lì non ho un nome che apre uno spiraglio verso una possibile soluzione, verso una trattativa, la libertà, lo scambio coi prigionieri, già è pensato e proposto tra le condizioni dettate da altri altrove. 
nel mondo dal quale sono isolato, ma che lavora, si mobilita, mette in moto una catena di solidarietà per me impensabile, meravigliosa. Piango, commosso, quel nome, Antaia, mi tocca nel profondo, era un segreto tra me e mia moglie, un grande desiderio su cui amo fantasticato per notti e giorni. Mi colpisce come una freccia dritta al cuore, è un nome che ricorderò spesso durante la mia prigionia, è diventato famoso in tutti i territori dei talibani. Thank you, thank you very much. Good evening. I will read to you two pages of a novel, The Secret Gardens of Mogador. Uh, this book is an exploration of woman's desire while pregnancy. That's one of the themes in the book. And it's the story of a woman who, she has a very recent lover, and uh, that she gets pregnant and her father dies. Her father is the gardener of the city, the only gardener. And there is a um, violent change in all the geography of her desires in her body. And the man, her lover, doesn't follow all these changes. So she decides to educate him. To write this book, I made like uh, four years of inquiry, asking women about their sexual life where, while they were pregnant. And I found that there is many cases, of course, but there was a minority of women who decide to educate their men. These characters inspired in that kind of woman. And the pages I will tell, well, this woman in the book, she challenges the man to educate him and decides to transform him into a shaharasat. And she tells him, we will not make love again if you don't come each night to tell me one of the gardens of Mogador. But in Mogador there is no garden. So it's garden in the sense of a place or something that a people transforms with such an intensity of passion that becomes paradise. She has the idea that if he knows, if he learns how to read the desires of the world, she will, he will become a better reader of the desires in her body he will become a better lover. Uh, as a storyteller, I don't care very much if he becomes a better lover. I only want him to become a better storyteller. And all the book is the stories she tells, is the secret gardens of Mogador. But I will tell you um, two pages from, from, the, from the, almost the beginning, when uh, the, the changes be become, uh, uh, begin to transform her body, And the man, and, and um, she becomes obs obsessed with gardens and the idea of a garden. And the man looks at her and tells this story with amazement and not understanding what is happening. It's called Hasiba, the Obsessive Gardener. Aquella mañana tuve finalmente que aceptarlo. Se había apoderado de Jaciba una extraña obsesión por los jardines. Comenzó como cualquier otra manía, con una mirada extraña, indescifrable. ¿Qué veía Jaciba en todo eso con nueva fijeza? Al principio no le di mucha importancia. Luego parecía dejarse hipnotizar por ciertas flores, como si mirara al mar o al fuego. En todos los rincones de la ciudad y hasta en las calles quería sembrar árboles. No solo quería entrar en el patio interior de todas las casas de Mogador, donde hubiera el menor indicio de una planta, sino que, además, comenzó a mirarnos a todos y a todo como si fuéramos parte de algún jardín en movimiento. Según ella, sus amistades se marchitaban o florecían. Algunas se, plegaba, se plagaban. Había también personas que eran flores de un día, injertos, abonos y podas, eran algunas de sus palabras favoritas para describir todo lo que hacía y por qué lo hacía. Para ella, el mundo entero se convirtió de pronto en la transcripción de un gran jardín, 
el jardín que contiene a todos los jardines. Un día la sorprendí sentada cerca de su ventana, ofreciendo su piel al primer sol del día. Los pies primero, luego las piernas y más tarde la madeja de su pubis, que ella miraba como si fuera un arbusto, un bosque, un sembradío. Mis plantas se alegran, me dijo sonriente, sin retirar la vista del mechón de bellos alborotados sobre su vientre. Una nueva línea oscura parecía crecer delicadamente hacia su ombligo. Era feliz, estaba llena de paz, como alguien contemplando uno de esos paisajes que llenan el horizonte. Pero comencé de verdad a preocuparme el día que ella despertó emocionada, gritando, ya llegó el gran jardinero, justo cuando iba saliendo el sol. Abrió la cortina hasta que se iluminó un filón de su cama y se desnudó para ofrecerse al primer rayo de calor de la mañana. Extendió sus piernas muy lentamente, luego fue separándolas con emoción y, sin tocarse, muy despacio, columpiando su respiración y su pubis al filo tenaz de la luz, hizo el amor con el sol. Yo la miraba en silencio, asustado y fascinado al mismo tiempo, lleno de escalofríos, celoso de los dedos afilados del sol. No me atreví a tocarla o siquiera a interrumpirla. Sentí que mis manos estaban, sin remedio, muy frías. Después de haber recuperado el aliento, pero aún respirando profundamente, Jaciba se acercó despacio, me acarició la mejilla, me dio un beso y me dijo al oído, con voz lenta y grave, que su felicidad era enorme, que había estado en el paraíso, en el jardín de los dedos del sol. Me quedé mudo, atado a mi sorpresa. Esa misma noche y los días siguientes, traté de meterme en la piel del fantasma solar que la había hecho tan feliz. Un reto mucho más difícil de lo que podía haberme imaginado y que me llevaría a enfrentar pruebas extrañas, casi increíbles. A ratos me pareció imposible meterme en la piel de alguien que no existía sino en sus deseos. Tardé en darme cuenta de que necesitaba transformar completamente mis movimientos, mi forma de escucharla, mi mirada. Tenía que ser otra la música de mi sangre, la paciencia de mi tacto. Poco a poco iba logrando aquí y allá una flor, luego un brote, pero sin hacer de verdad jardín en su cuerpo resplandeciente. El deseo de Jaciba, sin duda, había crecido como un mediodía y tomaba formas exigentes que para mí eran completamente inesperadas y desconocidas, francamente incomprensibles. Entonces, no pude contenerme y cometí una de mis más grandes sorpresas. Comencé a hacer interminables bromas sobre su nueva obsesión jardinera, lo que a Jaciba nunca terminó de hacerle gracia. Las bromas se le volvieron poco a poco hirientes, sin que yo tuviera conciencia del daño que hacía. Fue germinando en su piel la sensación de no ser comprendida, y de pronto me veía cada vez más lejano, incapaz de seguirla en sus inquietudes, sordo a su nueva voz. De cualquier modo, entre broma y broma, yo seguía haciendo esfuerzos, pocas veces atinados, por convertirme en el paraíso particular de esta mujer obsesiva. Solo a ratos lo lograba. Al menor indicio de incomprensión, ella me expulsaba de su cuerpo, del ámbito de su cuerpo, que era sin duda para mí el verdadero paraíso. Muchas gracias. The translation is by Rhonda Dal Buchanan. Thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Yi Yun Lee, and I'm a Chinese writer living in America. And I'm going to read uh, a small excerpt uh, from my novel, and I'm going to read in English. 
The day started before sunrise, on March 21, 1979, when Teacher Gu woke up and found his wife sobbing quietly into her blanket. A day of equality it was. Also, it had occurred to Teacher Gu many times when he had pondered the date, the spring equinox, and again the thought came to him: the daughter's life would end on this day, when neither the sun nor its shadow reigned. A day later, the sun would come closer to her and to the others on this side of the world, imperceptible perhaps to dull human eyes at first. But birds and worms and trees and rivers would sense the change in the air, and they would make it their responsibility to manifest the changing of seasons. How many miles of river melting, and how many trees of blossom blooming would it take? Would it take for the season to be called spring? But such naming must mean little to the rivers and flowers, when they repeat their rhythms with faithfulness and indifference. The date set for his daughter to die was as arbitrary as her crime, determined by the court of being an unrepentant counter-revolutionary. Only the unwise would look for the significance in the random date. Teacher Gu willed his body to stay still and hoped his wife would soon realize that he was awake. She continued to cry. After a moment. He got up bed and turned on the only light in the bedroom, an aging ten watt bulb. A red plastic clothesline ran from one end of the bedroom to the other. The laundry his wife had hung up the night before was damp and cold, and the clothesline sagged from the weight. The fire had died in a small stove in a corner of the room. Teacher Gu thought of adding coal to the stove himself, and then decided against it. His wife, on any other day, would be the one to revive the fire. He would leave the stove for her to tend. From the clothesline, he retrieved a handkerchief, white with printed red Chinese characters, a slogan demanding absolute loyalty to the Communist Party from every citizen, and laid on her pillow. Everybody dies, he said. So this is the opening of the novel when Teacher Gu and、uh, Mrs. Gu they're going to lose their daughter on this day and she's going to be executed. And after her execution, Teacher Gu had a,、um, became ill and he was hospitalized for a few days. And in the hospital, he started to talk to his first wife in his mind. So she, he married his first wife. Uh, before communism took over China, and he was a nationalist, education, a philosopher, and education expert, while his wife was a Communist Party member at the time, illegal. So he did not know his wife was an underground party member. And after communism took over China, she filed a divorce against him and said he, she said their their marriage could not live up to the time. So. In the hospital, he started to talk to her, and after he was released from the hospital, he started to write letters to her. And I'm going to read just one letter. He, the first letter he wrote to her. Greatly respected Comrade Chan, he started the letter, and then saw the opening ridiculous with its revolutionary ugliness. Even though he had addr addressed her with this formality in his letters once or twice a year for the past thirty years, he ripped the page off the notebook and started again. My once close, closest friend, colleague, and beloved wife, he wrote with great effort. My once closest friend, colleague, and beloved wife, he read it aloud. And decided that it suited his mood. Remembered an umbrella that my father lent my mother at a street corner in Paris that started their lifelong love story. It was in the autumn of 1916, if you still remember. You said what a romance when I first told you the story. I'm writing to let you know that the emblem of this great love no longer exists. 
The umbrella did not survive my daughter's death because her mother, my current wife, saw the daughter need an umbrella in heaven. So the mother burned the umbrella. Was there a heaven above? I wonder if my parents are fighting with my daughter for possession of the umbrella. The grandparents had not met the granddaughter in life. In death, I hope they do not have to spend a long time in the company of the girl. My parents, as you may remember, possess the elegance and the wisdom of intellectuals of their generation. My daughter, however, was more a product of this revolutionary age. She died of a poison that she had herself helped concoct. Despite art and philosophy and your mathematics and my faith in, enlight in enlightenment, in the end, what marks our time? Perhaps we could take the liberty to believe, for all we know, that this time may last for the next hundred years. What marks our time is the moaning of our bones crushed beneath the weight of empty words. There's no beauty in this crushing, and there is, alas, no escape for us. Now or ever. Teacher Gu stopped writing and read the letter. His handwriting was a shaky old man's, but there was no point in being ashamed at the loss of his capacity as a calligrapher. He folded the letter in a special way that young lovers had folded love notes 40 years earlier and put it in the envelope. Only then did he realize he had forgotten to ask the question. He had wasted time and space in a useless, moody letter. He opened his notebook. Highly respected Conway Chan, please tell me in all honesty if you were assigned to marry me by your party leaders for your communist course. I'm getting closer to death each day, and I prefer not to leave this world a deceived man. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Miguel Sihuko. I'm from the Philippines. I'm going to be reading from my brand new novel, Illustrado. Um, I just want to say I'm really thrilled to be here. It's my first book. So. Thank you. Thanks. I'll be reading from the beginning. The panther lurks no longer in foreign shadows. He's come home to rest. Crispin Salvador's fitting et epitaph by his request is merely his name. From an unattributed obituary, the Philippine Sun, February 12, 2002. When the author's life of literature and exile reached its unscheduled terminus that anonymous February morning, he was close to completing his controversial book we'd all been waiting for. His body, floating in the Hudson, had been hooked by a Chinese fisherman his arms, battered, open to a virginal dawn, Christ-like, one blog back home reported, sarcastically. Ratty banded briefs and Armenia Gildo Zenia trousers were pulled around his ankles, both shoes lost. A crown of blood embellished the high forehead, smashed by a crowbar or dock pile or chunk of frozen river. That afternoon, as if in a dream, I stood in the brittle cold, outside the yellow police tape surrounding the entrance of my dead mentor's West Village apartment. The rumors were already milling. The NYPD had found the home in disarray. Plainclothes detectives filled many evidence bags with strange items. Neighbors reported having heard shouts into the night. The old lady next door said her cat had refused to come out from under the bed. The cat, she emphasized, was a black one. Investigators quickly declared there was no evidence of foul play. You may recall seeing the case in the news, though the coverage was short-lived in the months following September 11, 2001. Only much later, during lulls in the news cycle, was Salvador mentioned at any length in the Western media, a short feature in the art section of the New York Times, a piece in Le Monde on anti-colonial expatriates who lived in Paris, 
and a negligible reference at the end of a Village Voice article about famous New York suicides. After that, nothing. At home in the Philippines, however, Salvador's sudden silencing was immediately autopsied on both sides of the political divide. Both the Philippine Gazette and the Sun traded blows with Salvador's own Manila Times, debating the author's literary and indeed social significance to our weary country. The Times, of course, declared their dead columnist the waylaid hope of a culture's literary renaissance. The Gazette argued that Salvador was not an authentic Filipino writer because he wrote mostly in English and was not brown by the same sun as the masses. The Sun said Salvador was too middling to merit murder. Suicide, each of the three papers concluded, was a fitting resolution. When news emerged of the missing manuscript, every side discarded any remaining equipoise. The legend of the unfinished book had persisted for over two decades, and its loss reverberated more than its author's death. Online, the blogosphere grew gleeful with conjecture as to its whereabouts. The literati, the career journalists foremost among them, abandoned all objectivity. Many doubted the manuscript's existence in the first place. The few who believed it was real dismissed it as both a social and personal poison. Almost everyone agreed that it was tied to Crispin's fate. None among Salvador's colleagues and acquaintances, he no longer had any real friends, questioned the suicide verdict. After two weeks of conjecture, Everyone was happy to forget the whole thing. I was unconvinced. No one knew what I knew. And I'm, I'm, so what I've done with this book is I've created the whole life's work of Crispin Salvador. Um, so there are excerpts from his memoirs and poetry and fiction and interviews. And through that, I've been able to trace 150 years of Philippine history. And I'd like to read just a, a short passage from one of Crispin's works. From, from his, um, his, his memoir, uh, the massive 2,500-page uh, self-published uh, book, Autoplagiarist. On one of the last few days before the city fell to the Japanese, we lined Dewey Boulevard, scores of us along the broad avenue, the breeze off the bay just cool enough for goosebumps. I was perched on Tita Jason's shoulders, and I remember watching birds dueling recklessly in the blue sky above the long curve of water. They fled into the endless expanse when a bugle called. The sky then was still trying to retain its innocence. Then I, then I saw the men on their mounts arriving for their dramatic departure, dividing the crowd, splendid, tall, like centaurs passing through wheat. They came, the 26th Cavalry Regiment of the Philippine Scouts, Americans and Filipinos side by side information in two long columns. I still hear their equipment jangle, the slow clop of hooves, still see the sun reflecting on their horses' polished martingale, on their own breast buckles and the insignia of the charging horse head and the saber raised above it. The metal on their bodies glowed like our hearts. The Japanese were to land at Lingayan and the cavalry began their journey to be among the first of the United States armed forces in the foreign east in the Far East to meet them. We, the people, were silent. Then we cheered, women reaching hands to caress the soldiers' boots and legs, to stroke the horses' manes and flanks, the way hopeful believers hold their hands out to rub the feet of cathedral saints. I remember and regret. I covered my ears from the cheers. I've never heard its equal since. Tito Jason handed me to one of the riders, his brother, my uncle, Tito Odiseo, who let me ride in front of him for some way. When I was finally passed back from uncle to uncle, I struggled, not wanting to be left behind. I cried. The lines of the cavalry took an eternal instant to pass among us. When the spectators closed the gap behind them, those around us shook their heads and made the sign of the cross. Many wept. I could feel Tito Jason shudder convulsively as he lost sight of his brother. I held on to my uncle as we all listened to the sound of hooves fading. My young boy's memory may have inflated these details, but this is how I remember, remember that day. 
outside the town of Morong on January 16, 1942, that group of brave men and strong steeds later made the final horseback cavalry charge in the history of the U.S. military. These were the last of an ancient tradition, many felled by the cowardly hail of anonymous lead and mortars from Japanese positions. Those of the 26 who survived the charge fought on as infantry. Eventually, attrition forced General Wainwright, a cavalryman himself, to give the order to butcher the horses for food. How cruel that meat must have taken, tasted. Since then, the U.S. and Philippine cavalry have been tanks and helicopters, machines that know not the sacrifice of courage and duty. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Andrzej Stasiuk uh, from Poland. I have a sad story. Beata o tej porze spała. To było na Pradze. Jej ciało w ciemności przypominało trochę księżyc. Kijowska już obumarła. Samochody wjeżdżały w tysiąclecie. Niektóre miały stamtąd już nie wrócić. Podróż w jedną stronę. Najpierw do wiaduktu przy Radzymińskim, potem za Braniecką i dalej na utratę pomiędzy wierzby i śmietniki pod bezgwiezdne niebo, gdzie chłopcy raz, dwa, trzy radzili sobie i świt zostawał tylko wypatroszone kolorowe skorupy karoserii. Prześcieradło okrywało ją do pasa. Wielki sarkofag wschodniego świecił słabym, brudnym blaskiem. Światło ocierało się o szyby pokoju, lecz nie mogło dostać się do środka, bo jej ciało było jeszcze zbyt młode. Nie rozmyślało o śmierci, ani o niej nie śniło. W drugim pokoju spała matka. Była jeszcze kuchnia. To wszystko. Na podłodze PCV i dywaniki, kryształowe kieliszki w błyszczącym kredensie, jej pokoik był ciasny i wypełniony w odróżnieniu od pokoju matki, w którym słowa przepadały tak samo jak dym z papierosa, bez ślady. Tutaj rzeczy piętrzyły się, wchodziły na siebie, wtulały się i obejmowały. Czasami budziła się w nocy, siadała na łóżku z zamkniętymi oczami, dotykała wszystkiego i rozpoznawała szary miś, któremu dziesięć lat temu robiła zastrzyki kroplomierzem z błękitną gumką, Mała gitara, właściwie ukulele, którego nikt nigdy nie potrafił nastroić, więc tylko od czasu do czasu wygrywała na jednej strunie jakąś zasuszaną melodię, wadząc wypalonej gliny, do którego wkładała coś, co miało się przydać albo nie zginąć i w jego brzuchu rosły warstwy zapomnianych historii, sprawy do załatwienia, rzeczy do obejrzenia i dotknięcia, guziki, rozsypane sznury paciorków, bilety na pamiątkę, puste zapalniczki, grosze, kolczyki bez sztyftów, Zielone banknoty z generałem, flakoniki po olejkach, pół obcinacza do paznokci ze złotą rybką zatopioną w zielonej emali, tekturka z zatartym arabskim napisem. Tuż przy tapczanie stała półka z nocną lampką i parama książkami o diecie i filozofii. Tych drugich nie otwierała. Wystarczyło jej, że są, że może dotykać kolorowych grzbietów i okładek, na których przedstawione były bóstwa albo twarze mężczyzn o półprzymkniętych powiekach z wieńcami pomarańczowych kwiatów na szyi. Obok stała popielniczka z modeliny, którą sama ulepiła i sama wypaliła w piekarniku. Teraz pusta i czysta, bo miesiąc temu przestała palić. Porcelanowa tancerka bez ręki, szklane serce z dziurką, w której tkwiły dwa długopisy, czerwony i zielony. To wszystko było jej. I radiomagnetofon, i kasety w schludnym szeregu we wnęce regału mieszczącego jej garderoby i pleciony ze sztywnego włókna koszyk pełen tanich kosmetyków, których nie używało od paru tygodni, i lusterko, i trzy kaktusy na parapecie. Tak, to wszystko. Nie, jeszcze ściany, a właściwie jedna, ta nad tapczanem, drugą zajmował regał, a dwie pozostałe okno i drzwi. Wymalowała na niej wielkie żółte słońce. 
Matka wróciła z pracy i się wściekła, ale na tym stanęło. Ta droga impreza wzywać malarza. No więc dwa lata temu słońce, a rok później na jego zielonym tle postrzępiony liść konopi. Tym razem matka nie powiedziała nic w ogóle. Nie zauważyła. Zaraz potem doszło zdjęcie Kurta Cobaina. Płakała wtedy całą noc. Wzięła do łóżka magnetofon, wtuliła się w niego i całą noc puszczała w kółko Nevermind. Zasnęła zapłakana nad ranem. Matka weszła do pokoju, zobaczyła czarny kabel pełznący z kontaktu pod kołdry i krzyknęła Ty kretynko, prąd cię zabije. Zaczekała, aż stara wyjdzie do pracy. Wyjęła zdjęte ze ściany serce Jezusa w pozłaconych ramach. Wyrwała tekturkę i obrazek, a na jego miejsce włożyła kobejna. W jakiś czas potem dostała od Jacka wyrwaną z książki ilustrację. Na, obrazki był, na obrazku był Kryszna o błękitnym ciele i girlandy kwiatów. Od tego czasu przestała jej się śnić, że kocha się z Cobainem. Na początku trochę żałowała tych snów, obudziła się z nich zapłakana, trochę smutna i trochę szczęśliwa. Potem jednak pomyślała, że co innego pieprzyć się z facetem, a co innego jednak z Bogiem. Nawet w dzień, w mieście, w szkole wyobraża, wyobrażała sobie ciemne, ciemnobłękitne niebo. To tak. Jakby robić to z niebem, myślała i uśmiechała się do siebie. Powiedziała kiedyś o tym swojej koleżance. Tamta spojrzała na nią dziwnie, a potem powiedziała, ja już bym wolała z Cobainem, chociaż to był wrak i pewnie nie mógł. Siedziały na podwórku i patrzyły, patrzyły jak kolesie zbierają się w grupki i rozmawiają o tym facecie, którego rano znaleźli powieszonego na huśtawce. Miał 12 ran od noża. Zastanawiali się, czy te kosy dostał przed czy po. Ci, co go dobrze znali, wiedzieli, że to jest ostrzeżenie i odzywali się najmniej. A teraz spała na brzuchu, u jej ciało wypełniał niebieskawy blask, podobny do księżycowej poświaty. I trudno było sobie wyobrazić coś większego niż noc i coś mniejszego niż ona w tej miejskiej nocy, która wzbijała się w górę i sunęła na cztery strony, by połączyć się z ciemnością wszechświata. Zimny ogień płonął wewnątrz dworca. Facet w jasnym garniturze wyszedł z tego cały i próbował wsiąść do taksówki, lecz kierowca przycisnął zatrzask. Następny zrobił to samo i następny też. Wtedy nadbiegł kilku i odciągnęło go w bok, w dół, na ten ciemny, betonowy plac, gdzie za dnia nadaje się kolejowe przesyłki. Z nadportu wiał wiatr, niósł buczwiałą woń wody, pomieszaną z nerwowym zapachem śródmieścia. Pod światem na Zieleniecki ruszyli wyładowaną ładą Rosjanie, ciągnęli łózek, jechali na wschód. Za ścianą poruszyła się matka. Przecieli 11 listopada i zagarnął ich główny nurt targowej. Z przystanku prześpiących płynęła zwarta masa mężczyzn i ciągnęła na skos skrzyżowania. Wprost w otwarte drzwi żółto-niebieskich pociągów. Ząbki, drewnica, zielonka, kobyłka i tłuszcz odzyskiwały swoich facetów po pierwszej szychcie do FSO. Zrezygnowana sygnalizacja wyświetlała czerwone, ale oni szli i tak jak starodawna klasa robotnicza w zwartym szyku i heroicznym poczuciu, że świat wciąż do nich należy, a wieczni uśmiechnięci Koreańczycy z Deu są tylko przywidzeniem albo postaciami z kawału, który skończy się, nim przestanie być śmieszny. Kolorowe cyganki ustępowały im z drogi, a doliniarze mieli gdzieś ich kieszenie z portfelami, w których kwiły zdjęcia żon, dzieci i drobniaki na papierosy. Do wypłaty był kawałek czasu. Wszystko pachniało potem, metalem, szybkim myciem na fajrant i nawet w nocy w łóżkach ciągnęła od nich woń wielkiej fabryki, bo ojcowie przekazywali ją synom, a synowie swoim synom, tak jak przekazuje się cechy i talenty. Ale oni dostali tylko ten odór przegrzanego aluminium, stali, lakieru i gumy, smród powietrza spalonego elektrycznym łukiem. Dokąd właściwie idziemy? zapytał Paweł, gdy znaleźli się po drugiej stronie tej człowieczej fali. Chciałeś coś zjeść? Spróbujemy zadzwonić. Weszli do podziemnego przejścia. Jarzeniowe światło przypominało mgłę. Coś było widać, lecz nie bardzo wiadomo co. Ludzie tracili tutaj swoje kształty i odzyskiwali je dopiero, gdy wychodzili koło poczty, by złapać czwórkę, 26 albo 34 i znaleźć się na drugim brzegu rzeki, gdzie świat był zupełnie inny. 
Od dziesięcioleci wsiadali na Wileńskim z pociągów i PKS-ów, ubrani w skrzypliwe stroje i próbowali desantu imaginacyjnej konkwisty Śródmieścia z jego cudami, blaskiem i splendorem. Z Łochowa, z Małkini, z Pustelnika, z Razymina, z Poświętnego, z Guzowacizny, z Ciemnego, z tych wszystkich pipidów z kogutami o piątej rano, remizą i płaskim, zaoranym horyzontem, gdzie zanaś słońca podnosił się cień wielkiego miasta, niczym pustynna Fata Morgana, zwielokrotniona opowieściami tych, co byli, widzieli, dotknęli, albo słyszeli podawaną z ust do ust legendę, która nabierała realności z każdym powtórzeniem. To na ich pokuszenie. Dwie ulice dalej powstał bazar Różyckiego. Przy Brzeskiej pachniało wsią. Białe stosy sercowatych serów, jaja, kiszone kapusta, ogórki, pęczki martwych kurcząt, blade ciała ostubanych kur, żywe ptaki w zasranych klatkach, marchew, pietruszka, śmietana w bańkach, czarny rzepakowy olej, w monopolowych flaszkach worki z pszenicą, siemieniem, makiem, grochem, fasolą, beczki z kapustą, świńskie łby, krowia wymiona, muchy, swąt opalonego pierza, Suchy zapach jutowych worków, babskie pachy miód w butelkach, smalec, słoika, gryka, rabarbar, jagody mierzone półlitrowym kubkiem i kwaśny cuch chałup z tym samym od pokoleń powietrza. A już chwilę dalej pachniało śniącym plastikiem, celloidem i nonajronem. Bite suwy na obcasie z noskiem w górę, spinki z plexiglasu z gołą babą w środku, krawaty na gumce z gotowym węzłem i napisem de Paris. Złote łańcuszki, karminowy lakier, kremplini na ortalion, na srebrne guziki błyszczące jak szkło kozaki z eklerem, szwedy w niezniszczalny kant, bluzki obcisłe niczym podwodne skafandry, paski, pierścionki, pończochy, puderniczki, pasmanterie, portmonetki, wszystko z psychologicznych, kolorowych polimerów, jak w dziecinnym kalejdoskopie. Z kapuścionego smrodu wchodziło się w sterylne, połyskliwe barby i oni wszyscy tam wchodzili, ci, co nie mieli prawie nic a żywe kolory stworzone ludzką ręką oglądali jedynie w swoich kościołach podczas majowych nabożeństw. I to była jedyna prawdziwa rewolucja, bo dokonywała się w ich sercach i źrenicach, więc od tamtej pory szli na znaczeni i nic nie mogło ich powstrzymać w marszu ze wschodnich równin od Sokołowa Podlaskiego po Ostrów Mazowiecką, od Kałuszyna po Wyszku pod Mazowieckiego, Mińska po Ciechanowiec. Wyprawiali najpierw szpiegów, potem wysyłali szpice i w końcu zdobywali przyczółki w ząbkach zielonce Rembertowie na linii odchodzkiej w miejsca, gdzie o zachodzie można było dostrzec poszarpaną linię wieżowców Śródmieścia z Pałacem Kultury na tle czerwone jak Jezusowe serce z obrazu tarczy słońca. Good evening. Uh, I'm Finnish, Finnish Estonian author Sophie Oxaven, and I'm reading a chapter from my novel Perch in Finnish. It's translated in English by Lola Rogers. Um, the novel tells the tragic story of Estonia during the Soviet occupation, uh, but it also tells the story of two women haunted by their past the consequences of violence and how being molested can affect the choices you make in your life. The themes of the novel are quite harsh and heavy, and, and I quite often meet readers who are doubting if, if they can sleep after reading, reading the novel in bed, and, and that's why I quite often read the love scene, because it it's also a love story, so quite desperate one. 1936-1939 Länsiviro. Alide syö viisi terälehtisen sireenin kukan ja rakastuu. Sunnuntaisen kirkon jälkeen Alidella ja Ingelillä oli tapana mennä kävelylle hautausmaalle tapaamaan tuttuja, vilkuilemaan poikia, keimailemaan niin pitkälle kuin säädöllisen rajaa sallii. Kirkossa he istuivat aina yhtä kärsimättömästi koluveren prinsessa Augustan haunan vieressä. Pyörittelevät nilkkojaan odottaen, että pääsisivät näyttäytymään hautausmaalle, esittelemään muodikkaisin ja kallisarvoisin mustiin silkkisukkiin verhottuja nilkkojaan, astelemaan sievästi parhaimmissaan, kauniina ja valmiina antamaan silmää sopiville sulhasille. Ingel oli letittänyt hiuksensa ja kiertänyt sen kruunuksi pään päälle. Alide oli nuorempana jättänyt letin niskaan. 
Sinä aamuna hän oli puhunut, että leikkaisi hiuksensa, sillä hän oli nähnyt sarmantteja sähkökiharoita kaupunkilaistytöillä. Kahdella kruunulla sellaiset saisi, mutta Ingel oli kauhistunut ja sanonut, ettei ainakaan äidin kuule puhuta mistään tuollaisesta. Aamu oli jostain syystä erityisen kevyt ja sireenit erityisen huumaavia. Alide oli tuntenut olonsa aikuiseksi ja nitestellessään pelin edessä poskiaan. Hän oli ollut aivan varma, että tänä kesänä tapahtuisi jotain ihanaa hänellekin. Eikä hän muuten olisi löytänyt sireenin kukkaa, jossa oli ollut viisi terälehteä. Ei sellainen voi ennustaa väärin, varsinkin kun hän oli syönyt kuvan oikeaoppisesti. Kun väki vihdoin sorisi ulos kirkosta, työt pääsivät kävelylle hautausmaan kuusien alle. Saniaiset pyyhkivät heidän sääriään, oravat juoksivat oksissa ja hautausmaan kaivo vinkaisi välillä. Kauempana kraaksuvat varikset, mitä ne ennustivat sulhasista. Ingel hyräili. Vaak vaak, keles kahdesta vaar saa. Tulevaisuus paistoi taivaalta, elämä oli hyvää. Tulevien vuosien odotus säpisi sydänalassa, kuten nuorilla tytöillä yleensä. Sisarukset olivat juuri ehtineet kiertää koko hautausmaan sivistä välillä keskenään ja pysähtyä välillä juttelevaa tuttujen kanssa, kun alinen silkkimekko tarttui haudan rautat ajadaan kiemuraan ja hän kumartui irroittamaan sitä. Silloin hän näki miehen saksalaisten hautojen luona. Hänet kiviaaran vieressä, vajupuut aurinko, kiviaaran sammaleet, kirkas valo, kirkas nauru. Mies nauroi jonkun kanssa, kumartui auenneiden kengänauhojen vuoksi ja jatkoi puhettaan. Käänsi kasvossa ystävänsä kohti solmien samalla kengän nauhaa, nousi yh- ylös yhtä sulavasti kuin oli kumartunut. Alide unohti pekkoinsa. Nousi ylös ennen kuin oli tajunnut irrottaa helman. Silkin repeävä ääni havahdutti hänet ja hän irrotti kankaan. Pudisti ruostimurusat käsistään ja luojan kiitos repeämä oli pieni. Ehkä sitä ei huomattaisi, ehkä mies ei huomaisi. Alide siloitti hiuksiaan tuntematta käsiään. Katso! Alide pureskeli huuliaan punaisemmiksi. He voisivat luontavasti kääntyä takaisin minä kiviaidan ohitse. Katso tänne päin. Katso minua. Mies lopetti jutustelonsa. Kääntyi heitä kohti. Kääntyi heitä kohti ja juuri samalla hetkellä Inger kääntyi katsomaan, mikä Alidea viivytti. Ja siinä samalla aurinko osui sisaren hiuskruunuun. Ei, ei, katso minua. Inger suoristi kaulaansa niin kuin usein teki. Ja niin, että tehdessä muistutti joutsenta. Nosti leukaansa ja he näkivät toisensa. Mies ja Inger. Alide tiesi heti, että mies ei koskaan näkisi häntä. Kun Alide näki, miten mies lopetti puheensa, miten hänen savukerasian taskusta ottanut käteensä pysähtyi kesken liikkeen, miten hän jäi kesken sanan tuijottamaan Ingeliä ja miten rasian kansi välähti veitsenä hänen kädessään. Ingel lähestyi Alidea. Katse keskittyi aina mieheen. Iho solisuissa hohti kaulakuopassa nousi kutsu. Vilkaisevalta sisartaan hän tarttui tämän käteen ja lähti viemään siskoa kohti kiviaitaa, jossa mies seisoi liikkumattomaksi pysähtyneenä. Ja nyt hänen ystävänsäkin ehti huomata, että mies ei kuunnellut, että savukerasiaa pitelevä käsi oli pysähtynyt sille korkeudelle, missä pyrkiluvut alkavat. Ja nyt miehen ystävä näki Ingelin, joka veti Alidea kädestä perästään, vaikka Alide yritti jokaisella askelella pistää vastaan, etsi tukea kivi. Aidasta juurta, johon tarttua kengän korko kaivautui multaan kerta toisessa jälkeen, mutta maapetti juuret vettivät. Huuset antoivat myöten, ruoha luisti, kivet vierivät Aliden jalkojen edestä ja kesäkärpäinen lensi Aliden suuhun, eikä hän saanut yskittyä sitä pois, koska Ingel ei halunnut pysähtyä, oli mentävä. Ingel veti ja veti ja polku oli tyhjä ja vei suoraan kiviaidan vierelle ja Aliden näki miehen tyhjän ajasta ja paikasta irroveen ilmeen ja tuusi Ingelin kiihkeät askeleet tiukan puristuksen sormissaan. Sisaren pulssi yskytti Aliden kättä vasten samalla, kun hänen kasvoiltaan valuivat kaikki vanhat ja tutut ilmeet. Ja sisko jätti ne taakseen. Ne lämähtivät perässä tulevan Aliden kasvoille. Märkinä suolaisena riekalaida ne takertuivat hänen poskilleen. Osalle nähti hänen ohitseen aaveina jo menneisyydenä. Ja Aliden kanssa aamulla naurattu hymykuoppa puhki sille nähtäessä pois Ingelistä. Kiviaidolle saapuessaan sisarossa oli tullut Alidelle vieras. Uusi Ingeli, joka... Ei enää kertoisi salaisuuksiaan vain Alidelle. Ei enää kävisi puistossa juomassa seltterisiä Aliden kanssa, vaan jonkun muun, uusi Ingel, joka olisi toisen oma, jonka ajatukset ja nauru kuuluisivat jollekulle muulle, sille, jolle hän itse olisi halunnut kuulua. Sille, jonka ihon Alide olisi halunnut haistaa, jonka ruumiin lämmön hän olisi halunnut sekoittuvan omaansa. Sille, jonka olisi pitänyt katsoa Alidea, nähdä hänet ja jähätynyttyä paikoilleen hänen tähtyään, juuri hänen takiaan taskusta hopeisen savukerasian nostaneen käden olisi jää, pitänyt jäädä paikoilleen. Mutta se olikin Ingel, jonka rasia välähdys leikkasi valoisella veitsellään pois Aliden elävästä. Naapurin aina juoksi paikalle kiviaidan viereen. Hän tulsi miehen ystävänä. Esitteli sisarukset heille. Pajut kohisivat. Mies ei katsonut Aliden päin edes tervehtiessään. Savukerrasian kolme viron leijonaa läikähtelivät auringosta ja nauraivat. 
taas Ingel, aina Ingel. Ingel oli aina saanut kaiken, ne niin tulisi aina saamaankin jo, sillä Jumalan pilkka alidaa kohtaan ei loppunut. Ei riittänyt, että Ingel muisti kaikki, ali, kaikki äidiltä pitot nik, pikku niksit, pesi astiat perunankeittoverelle ja sain loistavaan. Ei riittänyt, että Ingel ei, ei unohtanut neuvoja, kuten Alide, jonka jäljiltä pestyt lautaset olivat yhä rasvaisia. Ei. Ingel osasi kaiken opettelemattakin. Ingel lypsi ensimmäisestä lypsistään lähtien lehmät niin, että maito vahtosi kiulun reunan yli. Ingelin askeleet pellolla saivat vilja kasvamaan paremmin kuin kellään. Sekään ei riittänyt. Ingelin piti saada mies, jonka Alide oli nähnyt ensimmäisenä, sen ainoan, jonka Alide olisi halunnut. Olisi ollut kohtuullista, että Alide olisi saanut edes jotain, että hänen kömpelö elämänsä olisi saanut edes miehen, jonka hän olisi halunnut. Se olisi ollut oikein edes sen kerran, sillä syntymästä asti hän oli seurannut, miten Ingelin lypsemää maitoa ei ollut tarpeen edes siivilöidä, sillä Ingel teki kaiken puhtaasti. Voitti maanuorten kerhon lypsykilpailut kirkkaasti. Alide oli katsonut, miten maan lait eivät koskeneet Ingeliä, miten Ingelin kiuluun ei tippunut lehmän karvoja eikä hiuksia, eikä Ingelin otsaa puhjennut täppylöitä. Ingelin hiki tuoksui orvokeelta. Naisten vaivat eivät turvottaneet hänen hoikkaa uumaansa. Sääsket eivät jättäneet loukamoja hänen heleään hipiäänsä, eivätkä tuokut syöneet Ingelin kaalipäitä. Ingelin tekemät hillat eivät pilaantuneet, eikä Ingelin hapankaali lähtenyt käymään. Hänen kätensä hetelmät olivat aina siurattuja. Maan nuorten kerhon rintamerkki kiirsi hänen rinnastaan kaikkein kirkkaimmin, ja sen neljäpila säilyi naarmuitta, kun taas pikkusisko hukkasi omaansa kerran toisensa jälkeen, ja sai äidin ensin pudistelemaan päätään. Jättämään sitten pudistelut, koska äiti ymmärsi, ettei auttanut, pudisteli hän päätään alidelle tai ei. Eikä riittänyt edes se, että Engel sai sen ainoan miehen, Hansin, joka oli saanut aliden sydämen pysähtymään. Ei, sekään ei riittänyt, vaan Engelin ihaltu kauneus ja taivaallinen hymy alkoivat Hansin tapaamisen jälkeen hehkua vielä ylimaallisemmin, vielä sokaisemmin. Ne valaisivat sataisenakin yönä talon koko pihan, täyttivät sisarusten aitan niin, ettei sen ilma riittänyt Alidelle, joka heräsi öisin siihen, että haukkoi happea, jonka oli huojuttava avaamaan aitan ovi. Eikä sekään riittänyt, vaan Aliden koettelemukset kasvoivat, vaikka sen ei olisi pitänyt enää olla mahdollista. Ne kasvoivat, koska Ingel ei pystynyt pitämään ajatuksiaan omanaan, vaan hänellä oli kuiskuteltava taukoa Hansista. Hans sitä, Hans tätä. Ja Ingel vaati vielä Alidea tarkkailemaan Hansia, tämä katseita ja eleitä. Olivatko ne tarpeeksi rakastavia? Katseliko hän muita? Vai näkivätkö hänen silmänsä vain Ingelin? Mikä, mikä tarkoitti se? Ja mitä tuo, mitä, tuo, mitä Hans oli sanonut? Mitä tarkoitti Ingelille ojennettu ruiskuukka? Tarkoittiko se rakkautta, rakkautta vai hänen? Ja kyllä, kyllä se tarkoitti. Hans kulki Ingelin hajun perässä kuin lemmenkipeä koira. Mourunta ja kuhertelu kujerrus pyyhkäisivät talon yli sellaisella vauhdilla, että vuoden sisällä pöytään ilmestyi pönöttämään punertava kosinta viinapullo. Sitten tuli morsiusaika ja Ingelin kapiokirstoa lihotettiin kuin porsasta ja Ingel liehui sen ympärille ja sulkatalkoissa tyttöjen kekatuksessa illalla tanssit ja sitten olikin jo uusi kuu, joka toi onnea ja terveyttä nuorille parille. Häät sitä, häät tätä, nuor- morsius pari kirkkoon ja takaisin. Väki odotti, pieni huntu hulmosi. Alide tanssi mustissa silkkisukissaan ja kertoi kaikille, kuinka onnellinen hän oli siskonsa puolesta ja siitä, että vihdoinkin taloon saatiin nuori isäntä. Hansin valkoiset hansikkaat hohtivat ja vaikka hän tanssitti Alidea yhden tanssin verran, Hans katsoi hänen lävitseen Ingeliä. Käänsi päätään sen mukaan, missä morsiamen huntu vilahti. Hans ja Ingeli yhdessä pellossa. Ingeli juoksemassa Hansia vastaan. Hans poimimassa Ingelin hiuksista heidän korsia. Hans tarttuvassa Ingelin vyötäisiltä ja pyörittävässä nuorikkoa pihalla. Ingeli juoksemassa tallin taakse. Hans juoksemassa Ingelin perässä. Naurua kikatusta tirskuttaa päivästä, viikosta, vuodesta toiseen. Hans tempaisemassa paitansa pois ja Ingelin kädet lennähtävässä Hansin iholle. Ingel kaatamassa vettä Hansin selkään, niin Hansin varpaa kipri, kipristävässä mielihyvässä, kun Ingel pesi hänen hiuksiaan. Kuiskuttelua, sopattelua, hiljaista vuodenpahteiden sahiraa öisin. Patien heineen kahina ja se rautasen kipinä, hyssyttelyä, kikatusta, huokailua, tyynyn painettua vaikerusta ja käsillä vaimennettua uikutusta. Hikinen kuumuus hohkasi seidän läpi aliden piinattuun vuoteeseen asti. Sitten hiljaisuus, jonka jälkeen Hans avasi ikkunan kesäyöhön. Lojasi karmiin ilman paitaa ja poltti paperustin. Sen pää hehkui pimeässä. Jos Alide meni ihan kiinni ikkunaan, hän näki sen ja paperirosteja pitelevän suonikkaan pitkäsormisen käden joka tipautti neilikka penkkiin tulipään. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Atik Rahimi from Afghanistan, but uh, I'll read in French. Because I'm in exile, in exile not only in another country, but also in another language. Why? When I read, you will understand. This is a story of a woman, Afghan woman. She's talking with her husband, who's in coma. She doesn't know. We, doesn't, we don't know. But me, I hope he, her, has her woman and he understand her. <coughs> Elle revient, la femme, moins nerveuse. Ça, c'est auprès de l'homme. Tout à l'heure, c'était le mot-là. Il est venu pour notre séance de prière. Je lui ai confié de, depuis hier que j'étais devenu impur, que j'avais mes règles. Comme Eve, il n'a pas apprécié. Je n'ai pas compris pourquoi. Parce que j'ai osé de me comparer à Eve ou parce que je lui ai parlé de mes règles. Il est parti en grommelant dans sa barbe. Avant, il n'était pas comme ça. On pouvait plaisanter avec lui. Mais depuis que vous avez proclamé cette nouvelle loi dans le pays, lui aussi, il a changé. Il a peur, le pauvre. Son regard se pose sur le Coran. D'un seul coup, elle sursaute. Merde, la plume. Elle la cherche dans les pages du livre. Ne la trouve pas. Sous l'oreiller, ne la trouve pas. Dans ses poches, la trouve. Après un ouf, elle reprend sa place. Ce moment-là me fait perdre la tête, dit-elle en remettant la plume à l'intérieur du Coran. De quoi je parlais Oui, de miracles. Bien sûr je lui ai menti. Elle jette un regard vif, plus malicieux que complaisant vers l'homme. Comme je t'ai menti à toi, plusieurs fois. Elle ramasse ses jambes contre sa poitrine et coince son menton entre les genoux. Mais il faut que je t'avoue quand même une chose. Elle le regarde longuement, toujours avec la même étrange inquiétude dans l'oreille, dans l'œil. Tu sais, ta voix est elle se rafraîchit la gorge avec sa salive et lève la tête. Lorsque nous nous sommes trouvés la première fois au lit, après trois ans de mariage, tu, je te rappelle, cette nuit-là, j'avais mes règles. Son regard fuit l'homme pour se perdre dans le pli de haras. Elle met sa joue gauche sur les genoux. L'œil que porte une cicatrice perd de son inquiétude. Je ne t'ai rien dit. Et toi, tu croyais que le sang était signe de ma virginité. Un rire, un rire sourd secoue son corps à ramasser à bouton. Voyez le sang, tu t'es ravi, fier, un temps, un regard. Et la crainte d'entendre un cri de colère, une insulte, rien. Alors douce et sereine, elle se laisse aller dans les gros coins intimes de ses souvenirs. Normalement, je ne devais pas avoir mes règles, mais ce n'était pas la période. J'avais une semaine d'avance. C'était forcément dû à l'angoisse et à la peur de te rencontrer. Enfin, imagine, être fiancé pendant presque un an et marié pendant trois ans à un homme absent, ce n'est pas évident. Je vais avec ton nom. Je ne t'avais même pas vu, entendu, touché auparavant. J'avais peur, peur de tout, de toi, du lit, du sang. Mais en même temps, c'était une peur de que j'aimais. 
Tu crées ce genre de peur qui ne te loigne pas de ton désir. Au contraire, ça t'excite, ça te donne des ailes, même si ça peut te brûler. C'était cette sorte de peur que j'avais. De jour en jour, elle prenait du volume en moi, envahissait mon ventre, mes tripes. À la voie de ton arrivée, elle s'est vidée. Et ce n'était pas une peur bleue, non. Ce n'était une peur rouge, rouge de sang. Quand je n'ai parlé à ma tante, elle m'a conseillé de ne rien dire. Je me suis donc tu. Et cela m'a rangé. Bien qu'au vierge, j'avais vraiment peur. Je me demandais ce qui se passerait si jamais je ne perdais pas de sang ce soir-là. Sa main balait l'air comme si elle chassait une mouche. Ça aurait été vraiment une catastrophe. J'avais entendu tant d'histoires à ce sujet. Je pouvais tout imaginer. D'un temps ailleurs, faire passer le sang impur pour le sang de la virginité, c'était une idée géniale, non Elle se couche et se love contre l'homme. Je n'ai jamais compris pourquoi, chez vous, les hommes, la fierté, étaient tant liés au sang. Sama se lève encore dans les airs. Ses doigts bougent. On dirait qu'elle faisait signe à quelqu'un d'invisible de s'approcher. Mais tu, tu te rappelles qu'un soir, c'était au début de notre vie commune, tu étais rentré tard, ivre mort, tu avais fumé, je m'étais endormi. Sans me dire un mot, tu as baissé mon pantalon. Je me suis réveillé, mais j'ai fait un semblant de dormir profondément. Tu m'as pénétré. Tu as eu tout le plaisir du monde, mais lorsque tu t'es levé pour te laver, tu as perçu du sang sur ta queue. Furieux, tu es revenu et tu m'as battu au beau milieu de la nuit. Juste parce que je ne t'avais pas averti, que j'avais mes règles, que je, je t'avais sali. Puis calme t elle J'ai fait de toi un impur. Sa main, saisie dans l'air, ses souvenirs, se referme et descend pour caresser son ventre qui enfle et se détend à une cadence plus rapide que celle de la respiration de l'homme. D'un geste brusque, elle fait glisser sa main vers le bas, sous sa brosse, entre ses cuisses. Ferme les yeux, respire profondément, douloureusement. Elle enfonce les doigts entre ses jambes avec violence, comme si elle allait y planter une lame. Retenant son souffle, elle retire sa main dans un cri étouffé. Ouvre les yeux, regarde le bout de ses ongles. Ils sont mouillés, mouillés de sang, rouges de sang. Elle passe sa main devant le visage absent de l'homme. Regarde, c'est toujours mon sang propre. Entre mes monstrueux et le sang propre, quelle différence Qu'y a-t-il de répugnant dans ce sang Sa main descend près du nez de l'homme. Tu es né de ce sang. Il est plus propre que ton propre sang à toi. Il lui touche brutalement la barbe avec ses doigts. Lui frôle les lèvres. Elle sent son souffle. Un frisson d'angoisse lui parcourt la peau. Son bras tressaille. Elle retire sa main, serre les doigts et la bouche contre l'oreille pousse encore un cri. Un sol lent. Déchirant, elle reste immobile, longtemps, très longtemps, jusqu'à ce que le porteur d'eau frappe à la porte des voisins, que la toux cavernose de la vieille voisine traverse le mur, que le porteur d'eau vide son outre dans le réservoir du voisin, que l'une de ses filles pleure dans le couloir. Alors, elle se lève, quitte la chambre, sans oser regarder son homme. another part of my book which explains the title of this book the passion the passion stone who and passion at sangi sabur elle revient remplir la poche de la perfusion 
Maintenant, je comprends enfin ce que disait ton père à propos d'une pierre sacrée. C'était vers la fin de sa vie. Toi, tu étais absent, reparti une fois de plus à la guerre. Il y a quelques mois, juste avant que tu reçoives cette base, ton père était malade. Il n'avait que moi pour s'occuper de lui. Il était obsédé par une pierre magique, une pierre noire. Il en parlait sans cesse. Comme, comment l'appelait-il, cette pierre Elle cherche le mot. Aux amis qui venaient lui rendre visite, il demandait systématiquement de lui rapporter cette pierre, une pierre noire précieuse. Elle fronce le tube dans la gorge de l'homme. Tu sais, cette pierre que tu poses devant toi, euh, devant laquelle tu te lamentes sous tout tes malheurs, toutes tes souffrances, toutes tes douleurs, toutes tes misères, à qui tu confies tout ce que tu as sur le corps et que tu n'oses pas révéler aux autres. Elle règle le goutte à goutte. Tu lui parles, tu lui parles, et la pierre t'écoute, éponge tes mots, tes secrets, jusqu'à ce qu'un beau jour, elle éclate. Elle tombe en miettes. Elle nettoie et humecte des yeux de l'homme. Et ce jour-là, tu es délivré de toutes tes souffrances, de toutes tes peines. Comment appelle-t-on cette pierre Elle arrange le rat. À la voix de sa mort, ton père m'a fait venir seul auprès de lui. Il agonisait. Il m'a murmuré, « Ma fille, l'ange de la mort m'est apparu accompagné de l'ange Gabriel. Celui-ci m'a dévoilé, dévoilé un secret que je te confie. Maintenant, je sais où se trouve cette pierre. Elle est dans le Kaaba, à la Mecque, dans la maison de Dieu. Tu sais cette pierre noire autour de laquelle tournent des millions de pèlerins durant la grande île de Laïs Eh bien, ce n'est pas autre chose que cette pierre dont je te parlais. Au paradis, cette pierre servait de siège à Adam, mais après que Dieu a eu chassé Adam et Ève sur terre, il la descend pour que les enfants d'Adam puissent lui parler de leur détresse, de leur souffrance. Et c'est cette même Pierre que l'ange Gabriel a offert à Agar et à son fils Ismaël comme oreiller après qu'Abraham eut banni la servante et son fils dans le désert. Oui, une pierre pour tous les malheureux de la terre. Va là-bas, livre-lui tes secrets jusqu'à ce qu'elle se brise, jusqu'à ce que tu sois délivré de tes tourments. La teinte sombre de la tristesse envahit ses lèvres. Elle reste un moment dans un silence de deuil. D'une voix enrouée, elle poursuit. Depuis des siècles et des siècles que les pèlerins se rendent à la Mecque pour tourner et prier autour de cette pierre, je me demande vraiment comment ça se fait qu'elle n'est pas encore explosée. Un rire narquois fait teinter sa voix et ses lèvres reprennent leur couleur. Elle éclatera un jour, et ce jour-là, ce sera la fin de l'humanité. C'est peut-être ça, l'apocalypse. Quelqu'un marche dans la rue, elle se tait, les pas s'éloignent, elle reprend. Tu sais quoi Je crois l'avoir découverte, la pierre magique, ma pierre à moi. Les voix proviennent de des cambres de la maison voisine, l'empêche à nouveau de poursuivre sa pensée. Elle se lève névrosement et va vers la fenêtre, ouvre le rideau. Elle est pétrifiée par ce qu'elle aperçoit. Ça m'a couvre sa bouche. Elle reste muette, referme les rideaux, observe la scène par les trous du ciel jaune et bleu. Elle s'exclame, ils enterrent les morts dans leur propre jardin. Où est la vieille elle demeure immobile un bon moment. Accablée, elle retourne auprès de son homme. Elle s'allonge sur le matelas, contre sa tête, cache ses yeux dans le creux de son bras et respire profondément, silencieusement, comme avant, à la même cadence que le souffle.
Hi. Uh, my name is Mohsen Hamid, and I'm reading from my second novel, which is called The Reluctant Fundamentalist. And I'll read uh, a longer passage from the very beginning of the book, and then something a little bit shorter from halfway in. <coughs> this is how it begins. Excuse me, sir, but may I be of assistance? Ah, uh, I see I have alarmed you. Do not be frightened by my beard. I'm a lover of America. I noticed that you were looking for something. More than looking, in fact, you seem to be on a mission. And since I am both a native of this city and a speaker of your language, I thought I might offer you my services. How did I know you were American? No, not by the color of your skin. We have a range of complexions in this country, and yours occurs often among the people of our northwest frontier. Nor was it your dress that gave you away. A European tourist could as easily have purchased in Des Moines your suit with its single vent and your button-down shirt. True, your hair short-cropped and your expansive chest, the chest, I would say, of a man who bench presses regularly and maxes out well above 225, are typical of a certain type of American. But then again, sportsmen and soldiers of all nationalities tend to look alike. Instead, it was your bearing that allowed me to identify you. And I do not mean that as an insult, for I see your face as hardened, but merely as an observation. Come, tell me, what were you looking for? Surely at this time of day, only one thing could have brought you to the district of Old and Arkeley, named, as you may be aware, after a courtesan immured for loving a prince, and that is the quest for the perfect cup of tea. Have I guessed correctly? Then allow me, sir, to suggest my favorite among these many establishments. Yes, this is the one. Its metal chairs are no better upholstered, its wooden tables are equally rough, and it is, like the others, open to the sky, but the quality of its tea, I assure you, is unparalleled. You prefer that seat, with your back so close to the wall? Very well, although you will benefit less from the intermittent breeze which, when it does blow, makes these warm afternoons more pleasant. And would you not remove your jacket? So formal. Now that is not typical of Americans, at least not in my experience. And my experience is substantial. I spent four and a half years in your country. Where? I worked in New York and before that attended college in New Jersey. Yes, you're right. It was Princeton. Quite a guess, I must say. What did I think of Princeton? Well, the answer to that question requires a story. When I first arrived, I looked around me at the Gothic buildings, younger, I later learned, than many of the mosques of this city, but made through acid treatment and ingenious stone masonry to look older, and thought, this is a dream come true. Princeton inspired in me the feeling that my life was a film in which I was the star and everything was possible. I have access to this beautiful campus, I thought, to professors who are titans in their fields and fellow students who are philosopher kings in the making. I was, I must admit, overly generous in my initial assumptions about the standard of the student body. They were almost all intelligent and many were brilliant, but whereas I was one of only two Pakistanis in my entering class, two from a population of over a hundred million souls, mind you, the Americans faced much less daunting odds in the selection process. A thousand of your compatriots were enrolled, 500 times as many even though your country's population was only twice that of mine. As a result, the non-Americans among us tended, on average, to do better than the Americans. And in my case, I reached my senior year without having received a single B. Looking back now, I see the power of that system, pragmatic and effective, like so much else in America. We international students were sourced from around the globe, sifted not only by well-honed, standardized tests, but by painstakingly customized evaluations, interviews, essays, recommendations, until the best and brightest of us had been identified. I myself had among the top exam results in Pakistan and was besides a soccer player good enough to compete on the varsity team, which I did until I damaged my knee in my sophomore year. Students like me were given visas and scholarships, complete financial aid, mind you, and invited into the ranks of the meritocracy. In return, we were expected to contribute our talents to your society, 
society we were joining, and for the most part, we were happy to do so. I certainly was, at least at first. Every fall, Princeton raised her skirt for the corporate recruiters who came onto campus and, as you say in America, showed them some skin. The skin Princeton showed was good skin, of course, young, eloquent, and clever as can be, but even among all that skin, I knew in my senior year that I was something special. I was a perfect breast, tan, succulent, seemingly defiant of gravity, and I was confident of getting any job I wanted. Except one, Underwood, Sampson and Company. You have not heard of them? They were a valuation firm. They told their clients how much businesses were worth, and they did so, it was said, with a precision that was uncanny. They were small, a boutique, really, employing a bare minimum of people, and they paid well, offering the fresh graduate a base salary of over $80,000. But more importantly, they gave one a robust set of skills and an exalted brand name. So exalted, in fact, that after two or three years there as an analyst, one was virtually guaranteed admission to Harvard Business School. Because of this, over 100 members of the Princeton class of 2001 sent their grades and resumes to Underwood Sampson. Eight were selected, not for jobs, I should make clear, but for interviews. And one of them was me. You seem worried. Do not be. This burly fellow is merely our waiter, and there is no need to reach under your jacket, I assume, to grasp your wallet, as we will pay him later when we're done. Would you prefer regular tea with milk and sugar, or green tea, or perhaps a more fragrant specialty, Kashmiri tea? Excellent choice. I will have the same, and perhaps a plate of jalebis as well. There, he is gone. I must admit, he is a rather intimidating chap, but irreproachably polite. You would have been surprised by the sweetness of his speech, if only you understood Urdu. And then a short passage from a bit further on. <clears throat> I was telling you about the moment when I was forced to stare. We were lying on the beach, and many of the European women nearby were, as usual, sunbathing topless, a practice I wholeheartedly supported, but which the women among us Princetonians, unfortunately, had thus far failed to embr embrace, when I noticed Erica was untying the straps of her bikini. And then, as I watched, only an arm's length away, she bared her breast to the sun. A moment later, no, you're right, I'm being dishonest, it was more than a moment. She turned her head to the side and saw me staring at her. A number of possible alternatives presented themselves. I could suddenly avert my eyes, thereby proving not only that I had been staring, but that I was uncomfortable with what I saw. I could, after a brief pause, casually move my gaze away, as if the sight of her breast had been the most natural thing in the world. I could keep staring, honestly communicating in this way, my admiration for what she had revealed. Or I could, through well-timed literary illusion, draw her attention to the fact that there was a passage in Mr. Palomar that captured perfectly my dilemma. But I did none of these things. Instead, I blushed and said, Hello. <laughs> she smiled with uncharacteristic shyness, it seemed to me, and replied, Hi. I nodded, tried to think of something else to say, failed, and said, Hello, again. As soon as I had done this, I wanted to disappear. I knew I sounded unbelievably foolish. She started to laugh, her small breasts bouncing, and said, I'm going for a swim. But then, as she walked away, she half turned and added, You want to come? I followed her, watching the muscles of her lower back tense delicately to stabilize her spine. We reached the water. It was warm and perfectly clear, round pebbles and a flash of little fish visible below the surface. We slipped inside. She swam out into the bay with powerful strokes, and then she trod water until I'd caught up with her. For a time, we were both silent, and I felt our slippery legs graze each other as we churned the sea. I don't think, she said finally, I've ever met someone our age as polite as you. Polite, I said, less than radiant with joy. She smiled. I don't mean it that way, she said. Not boring polite, respectful polite. You give people their space. I really like that. It's unusual. We continued bobbing face to face, and I formed the impression that she was waiting for me to say something in reply, but words had abandoned me. 
Instead, my thoughts were engaged in a struggle to maintain a facial expression that would not appear idiotic. She turned and began to swim back to shore, keeping her head above water. I pulled alongside and, claiming victory at last over my cowering tongue, said, Shall we return to town for a drink? To which she replied, with a raised eyebrow and in an accent not normally her own, I would be delighted to do so, sir. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Tom Andrusty again. I just wanted to point out that all the writers that you've heard tonight will be doing um, all sorts of other events in the next few days. They'll be doing conversations and panel discussions and so on, and, and you should um, check out the program or look on the website, pen.org, have a look at the program there, and, and you, know, you can go and hear more of them um, if you've enjoyed this evening. I'm going to read... Um, just a few passages from an essay that I wrote in, in Granta magazine a couple of months ago um, about the deadly sin of sloth. It's my second favorite deadly sin. Um, I can't read the whole of it because I'm too lazy. So, so uh, I'll just read three or four short passages and then I'll be tired. So... Um, so the first, the first passage is called For and Against Sloth. Literature has not, on the whole, dealt kindly with sloth. In the Divina Commedia, Dante thinks that those who have accomplished nothing in life are not even worthy of being admitted into hell. Catullus says the following, Otium Catulae, tibi molestum est. Ocio exultas nimiumque gestis, ocium et reges prius et beatas perditit orbes. Don't you agree? <laughs> oh, well, I'll translate it, all right. You have nothing to do, Catullus, that's your problem. Through idleness, you run around too cheerfully. Idleness has destroyed kings in the past, and their rich cities too. Montaigne praises the Emperor Vespasian for continuing to govern his empire, even as he lay on his deathbed. An emperor, he said, must die standing. No pilot performs his office by standing still. In Conrad's Nigger of the Narcissus, the title character, James Waite, a black West Indian sailor who falls fatally ill with tuberculosis while his ship is on its way from Bombay to London, is asked why he embarked on such a long journey, knowing, as he must have known, that he was ill. And he makes the famous reply, I must live till I die, mustn't I? No pilot performs his office by standing still. I must live till I die. In Montaigne and Conrad, as in Dante and Catullus, slothfulness is invariably reprehensible. Action is good, inaction and evil, and that's all. But let us note that Montaigne, the author of Against Idleness, used to accuse himself of being slothful, saying that this was the reason why he wrote only little essays rather than full-length books. Uh, and so we come to De Quincey, ah, the English opium eater, unashamed of his slothfulness, who describes his account of opium eating and the hallucinations it induces as useful and instructive. He modestly calls himself a philosopher and an intellectual creature and acknowledges no guilt. He gives us accounts of his opium dreams and they are fine enough with sufficient phantasmagoria therein to satisfy the most gothic palate. But then he says of South Asia, my place of origin, that it is cruel, that its cultures make him shudder, that man is a weed in those regions. It is the man who speaks here, not the drug. I am terrified, he says, by the modes of life, the manners, the barrier of utter abhorrence and want of sympathy placed between us by feelings deeper than I can analyze. I could sooner live with lunatics or brute animals, he tells us. He tells me. After that confession, the stuff about his hallucinations feels oddly uninteresting, despite all the monkeys, parrots, and gods that appear in them to say nothing of the famous leering crocodile 
that haunts him constantly, the symbol of everything Eastern that he finds so repulsive. The problem lies not in the opium, but in the eater. As the old sailor Singleton says in The Nigger of the Narcissus, ships are all right, it's the men in them. There are worse sins than the deadly ones. Bigotry is high on that list. The second passage is called, in Russian, Oblomovshina. Of course, the best, strongest, funniest, most profound case in favor of sloth, without, with, without which no examination of the subject would be complete, can be summed up in a single word, Oblomov. Ilya Ilyich Oblomov, the most slothful of all Russia's indolent 19th century landed gentry. And the hero, yes, the hero of the novel by Goncharov that bears his name, is the exact opposite of Proust's insomniac Marcel. Marcel, we know, for a long time used to go to bed early and then took an unconscionable age, dozens and dozens of drowsy long sentence pages, actually to fall asleep. Oblomov, by contrast, lies in bed all day, sometimes awake, sometimes somnolent. He takes 150 pages, not to fall asleep, but rather to get up. When he is finally forced to rise, he is not wrapped in the soothing cadences of the Proustian sentence. He is not contemplative, but angry, and the reason for his wrath is plain enough. His servant, Zakhar, who has finally lost patience with his horizontal master, um, is to blame. And Oblomov's rage at the fellow is expressed in brief, direct utterances, shouting, and a fuddled attempt at physical chastisement. We can, of course, understand Oblomov's sloth, his Oblomovchina, his Oblomovism, or Oblomovitis, um, as, as the product of his spoiled, effete childhood, or as a metaphor for the decay and torpor of the class he represents. And that's true enough. But such narrow exegeses miss the point, which is that a little Oblomov lives within us all. We long to be allowed to languish for the rest of our lives, to be freed from responsibilities and to be, yes, happy parasites. Oblomov knows that his far distant estates are in trouble, that their finances need attending to, and that he ought, he really ought, to travel a thousand miles to deal with the problems. But no, like Bartleby, his American predecessor, he prefers not to. And again, even though he is in love, and the young lady Olga is delightful, and he really ought to get married. He puts the decision off until she makes it for him and breaks their engagement. He is procrastinating Hamlet as well as Bartleby, and he is all of us. We look at the state of the world, and we wish we too had the option of hiding away. Oblomov hides for us. We look at the opposite sex, and it overwhelms us. Oblomov retreats from it on our behalf. We know our own problems and we wish they were a thousand miles away. Oblomov sends them there and refuses to face them as we cannot, but as we wish we could. Oblomov justifies and validates our sloth. The next little passage is called Linda Evangelista. <laughs> Linda is a supermodel. No, Linda is the supermodel. Here are the important facts about her. She is known in the industry as the chameleon, but she is not, in fact, a lizard. She was once called the founder of the supermodel union, but, in fact, no such trade association exists. She told a Vogue journalist, Jonathan Van Meter, in 1990, that we, the supermodels, don't wake up for less than $10,000 a day. This is often misquoted as, I don't get out of bed for less than $10,000 a day. Now, in this interesting sentence, in either version, no fewer than three of the seven deadly sins, superbia, avaritia, and accidia, pride, greed, and sloth, are combined. <laughs> While a normal reaction to the, the statement, and indeed to Miss Evangelista herself, might combine elements of luxuria, invidia, and ira, which is to say lust, envy, and anger. <laughs> Only gula, gluttony, 
if absent, not bad. The last passage is called Ilya Ilyich Oblomov and Linda Evangelista. <laughs> I picture them in separate adjacent beds <laughs> in a light-filled, flower-perfumed Rococo bedchamber. <laughs> Oblomov is trying anxiously not to read the messages of financial urgency his manservant brings him. Linda, feigning sleep, is waiting for the telephone to ring with an offer of more than $10,000 <laughs> so that she can get up. The telephone rings. The offer is for Oblomov. He will receive $10,000 if he agrees to get out of bed. The offer is large enough to pay off all his estate's debts and leave him happily recumbent without a care in the world. He declines the offer. I prefer not to, he says. They remain in bed. Oblomov is content and drowsy. Linda is unhappy, tense, wide-eyed. But character is destiny, as Heraclitus said, and they are both in the grip of the terrible fate of having to be themselves. The, dra the day drifts on. Here we, lay, here we lie, they say silently, almost echoing Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms. We can do no other. They do not move. The manservant, Zakhar, brings in food on a dented silver tray. But they are both, for different reasons, in the grip of the sin of sloth. Linda, because she has not received the phone call. Oblomov, in spite of the one he did receive. And they do not eat. Uh, okay. Thank you.